Good evening and welcome to the West Shore Photography Club's regular Monday evening program. Today is January the 31st. Mm. I have a look at my notes for that. Uh, <laughs> and we have a really excellent program lined up for tonight with uh, Les Picker, professional okay. photographer. It is absolutely great. I'm going to mute everybody at this point, okay? And then if you need to talk and ask questions later, you can do that, unmute yourself. But I'm just gonna mute everybody for right now. And that means Les, you're, you're muted also, Les, so you have to unmute yourself, okay? And I can unmute you. Um, before we get started on tonight's program, I wanna just talk about some of the things that are happening this week at the, at the Photography Club. Uh, on Monday, uh, Wednesday night, we have a presentation by um, uh, Mike, Mike Donovan, and it's on the Lewis Hines show that's over at the Lebanon Valley College. Mike's going to give us a preview of that and step us through the life of Lewis Hine, and that'll be on Wednesday evening. You'll get an email on all the things I'm talking about here uh, shortly, uh, tomorrow morning. On Saturday, we have a field trip to the Strasburg Railroad, which is down near Lancaster. And uh, it is to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has a train museum. Think of a football field full of trains inside and, and out. It is really spectacular. And if you think to yourself, well, I don't know if I like to really photograph museum things, you will not be able to tell in your shots that you were inside a museum. It's that large and there's that much equipment in there and it's huge equipment. The good thing is right next door, the commercial railroad, the Strasburg Railroad is also open and they're gonna be running that day. And they have steam engines and they take uh, kid rides and adult rides on the trains. So we'll be able to photograph maybe some of that steam activity. And there's no admission charge for that if you don't take a ride on the train. Sunday, um, Mike and, uh, is going to take us over to the Lewis Hines show at the Lebanon Valley College, where the images are going to be on display. And uh, if, I really encourage you to attend Wednesday night his program because it's absolutely fascinating what he photographed back in the Depression era in a lot of young folks. Um, on Sunday, if you're going to be uh, participating in the West Shore Historical Society in the West Shore Photography Club March show at the Art Center. The digital images, these are just snapshots, little thumbnails we need to put into a book. They're, they're due on uh, Sunday. So if you could get those in, that would be great. And uh, we have sent off an email with has a little form in there, how you need to prepare it and stuff like that. Next Monday night, we have an image review and there's no theme. And Chris Heisey uh, will be the judge for that. And your images for that need to be in on Thursday evening. Uh, so mid month, we have uh, two trips planned for the Middle Creek, uh, one during the week and one on weekends. Now this is very much so subject to change. Middle Creek is where we have the migration of the geese uh, going back north. And uh, so we're, we're monitoring that but we do have intentions of doing that in, in mid-February here. And then in the latter part of February on the 23rd, we're gonna be doing our, our trip to the state capitol, which is where we have private access to locations within the, the capitol that most people can't get into. And uh, so we have some special connections there that enable us to do that. That is a really cool trip, but it has to be done during the week. And we're gonna do it on Wednesday, the 23rd, and you might want to consider if you're working full time is to maybe take a half a day and be done around noontime or so. It's very worthwhile and you'll get lots of information. But I wanted to mention to you, it's February 20, uh, 23rd. So, And those are the things that we have coming up. If there's any questions, just let me know. And um, so tonight we are really, really blessed to have with us Les Picker. And Les is a professional photographer based down in Maryland. And Les has have many publications 
uh, like 650 published articles, many books that he's authored and has been photographing for clients, some very large clients and for the National Geographic. He comes to us with a wealth of experience in photography as both as lecturing and also conducting workshops and of course his own personal portfolio that he's developed. He's an absolutely expert master printer. And uh, so we're really, really happy to have him here tonight. He was awarded the best photographer in the prestigious Canadian Northern Lights Award. That was a, that's a really high, high, high uh, achievement to have. He is in great demand as a keynote speaker for photography groups, um, for uh, clubs like ours to do lectures. Um, he lives in Maryland, but he's coming to us today from Maui. And I think you said it was 70 degrees there, right, Les? Yeah, 77. Um, so how this is gonna work is that this is not a presentation. This is a, a, a discussion, a conversation. We haven't done this before. So what we're gonna do is we're going to have um, a couple of folks that will ask Les some questions, and then we're gonna open it up to the floor for you to ask uh, Les any questions that you may have about his entry into photography, uh, what he views as artwork and things like that. Just, it's just a very free flowing opening uh, that we, a discussion that we're gonna have uh, with Les. And so I'm gonna ask Les, if you would, please just give us a brief overview. Uh, let me see, you're on. Uh, give us a brief overview, Les, if you would, about you, your journey into photography and a little bit about your story and career that you've had. Okay, and you said this thing was four hours long? Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> okay, you should have said my checkered career, not, not okay, at any event. So um, I, I wish I could turn the thing around here because just as, uh, before, just before Joe started his um, introduction, there were some humpback whales breaching uh, in the distance here. But at any event, um, so I, I'm coming from Maui and um, before I get going, I just want to say this, and this is not, uh, Joe did not pay me any money for to say this, but on the other hand, he's going to be embarrassed when I say it was such, it was a real blessing for me to uh, have Joe become my friend. Uh, this man is so knowledgeable about photography and so helpful. I mean, he's always willing to uh, help groups of people. He's been on trips with me and uh, he's the go-to source. People come to him with questions that, that uh, would probably frustrate me, but Joe is always there with an answer and, uh, and it's just been wonderful. So Joe, I just want to acknowledge that and thank you for having me. Uh, so how did I start? Um, I started in photography. My father was a, um, a noted, uh, uh, was a noted photographer, uh, amateur photographer in New York City. He was an immigrant and he just loved America. He loved New York City and he would go around photographing um, all around the city, including particularly Harlem and um, where everyone knew him as Mr. Martin. Uh, he gave me my first camera when I was 11 years old and that's, that's sort of my start. But all my father's brothers, he had three brothers, uh, they were all into photography of some sort, com commercial or otherwise. My father was an amateur. He uh, tested films for Kodak as an amateur. And uh, I'll never forget the day that Kodakram 64 came out. He was like, uh, you know, a, a pig in, <laughs> in his environment because he went from uh, Kodachrome with, you know, a, a 25 uh, uh, ASA in those days to 64. He was just ecstatic. Um, at any event, uh, when he passed away, the um, Museum of the City of New York asked us to donate his body of work. So my sister and I went through it. These were all in carousel trays, dozens and dozens and dozens of, of trays and, and, and um, boxes of slides that we gave to them. Uh, and uh, we're not sure even how they've used them, but he, he documented the 
construction of the World Trade Centers from digging a pit to topping off. Um, he was the, his, he, he did a lot of things uh, as an amateur. So I was sort of raised in that environment. My dad would take me to um, the uh, museums in New York, but also to a lot of uh, photographic exhibits. So I was really steeped in the old timers and, um, and that really helped my appreciation of photography. So that's how it all started. Um, I got a doctorate in um, ecology, in winter ecology from the University of Maine. And as a result of that, um, I was able to land some assignments from National Geographic, and, uh, but also for a lot of other magazines, um, even corporate publications, et cetera. So uh, I was a newspaper photographer also for a while, uh, like I said, kind of a checkered career. And uh, as, a, as a faculty member at the University of Maine and at the University of Delaware, I was able to travel and to places uh, under academic guise, but I was also able to photograph. So that's basically the story. Uh, the last uh, the last 25 years, approximately, uh, that's what I've done full time is the photography. Up to up to then, uh, I was doing photography uh, part time or like particularly in in summer times or um, whatever. Uh, but but anyway, that's how it developed, and and um, and I've been full time earning my living from that uh, since then. Joe, does that answer your question? Uh, I think so, very much so. Yes, but I think. Ask that's... more. What I'm thrilled about is that this is going to be a conversation, okay? Because you typically, as Joe knows, I give a presentation, uh, you know, mm -hmm. with all sorts of uh, uh, um, uh, helpful things to bring into the equation. But in this case, uh, it was just going to be informal. So ask whatever questions. If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you. And if I do know the answer, watch out because it might, okay. it might go long. <laughs> OK, how we're going to do this, um, Les, I'm going to call on uh, Merle Hirsch, which is one of our members. He has a, a question for you. And, okay. then gonna, and so Merle, do you want to um, give the question to uh, Les? Sure. Evening, Les. Hi, do, do you consider yourself a photojournalist or a fine art photographer? And how do you approach those two uh, genres a little differently? Great. Oh, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. Um, all right. My career has been as a, as a, if you will, a documentary or what we call an editorial photographer. So, um, for example, my whenever I did uh, work for National Geographic, we could do nothing with our images. Um, there, there may have been a contrast adjustment allowed. Uh, don't forget, my work with National Geographic was in the 1980s. So we didn't have digital. So uh, the first time I saw my, uh, my, um, my work on a, from an assignment, was when I got a call from the lab, uh, the Kodak lab in the basement of National Geographic saying, hey, your images are ready. Nobody saw the images until I saw them first. Not my editor, uh, not any of the writers, nobody. That was their commitment to photographers in those days. And I'd come in and with my fingers crossed and uh, you know every prayer that I could think of because you know you, you never knew. I've had cameras in those days. Uh, I was doing an assignment in Egypt, and um, that my my um, exposure meter got fried. It just stopped working. Uh, it, it was 120 degrees there, and and with a black camera, that does not help. <laughs> so it was uh, things like that would happen, uh, and sometimes Geographic would help out by sending something by airmail, uh, you know, by plane the next day, which I'd meet in the Cairo airport or whatever. But, but, uh, but my point is that uh, it was, it, you know, once we press the shutter, we were done. And we had to be careful and make sure to get the money shots that, that we needed. Uh, but also, it really depended on our, our technical skills. So that's my upbringing as a, uh, as an editorial photographer, uh, telling the story. Through, through your imagery. 
However, in, in the last 10 years, I've been evolving. And I'm very excited about that because I've switched from 35 millimeter to medium format. And uh, I am really working hard, I have to say, to be to move my photography more to fine art. Okay, that's that's been my goal over the last um, the last little while. Now, I have to say this because and I, and I don't mean this in any insulting way whatsoever, please. I have been trained in film. I've always been parsimonious with my with my sh pressing the shutter. I mean, we had 36 shots on a roll. And then if I had to change it in a, in a raging um, uh, desert storm or in, in, when it's minus 40 out, uh, you always, you had to be careful. So I had a, I, I was always very careful uh, with my shots. I've never been a, a quick shooter. I've never had a camera that where I've um, been able to capture 10, 12, 20. Uh, the new Nikon I understand does like 120 shots per second. I can't conceive of that. But the 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 thing is that um, it was it was easy for me to start the transition from editorial to uh, to um, fine art. Okay. And that's that's where my struggle is, if you will, right now. Okay. And the second part of that, how's it different? How does fine art differ? From, I mean, how do I, if I go out and take a picture, why is it fine art or not fine art? Great. Okay. Okay. This is important. Um, if if you a, a Fine art print, or fine, of course, I, I'm a believer that the the fo your your work is not done until it's on paper or on canvas or whatever until you can actually see it physically. But nonetheless, um, it's a fine art print really should reflect the artist's vision. And 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 before this uh, conversation, I just wrote some notes to myself about because I lecture on this and I and I have um, uh, clients who hire me on a one by one basis to help them advance their careers, whether it's in editorial work or in fine art photography. They need, you need to have an, in, if the work has an innovative style, if it's, if it's, um, they promulgate ideas that are not, that are not typically thought of. Um, fine art requires thought. It doesn't entail, if, if a person is taking 20 frames a second, um, there, it's not fine art. That is, we're, we're, and that's great. That, but that's editorial. That's documentary. Um, a fine art print provides uh, the 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 artist is thinking about balance, about structure, about color, about form, in ways that represents their own vision. So let's say you had 10, 10 photographers lined up and they shoot the same scene. The camera is pretty adept at capturing that scene. I mean, scene. I mean most of you probably f photograph on manual, but if you did <laughs> by accident put it on some automatic setting, it would take a decent picture, a relatively decent, okay? Unless it's backlit or some special uh, 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 condition. But, um, but that nine out of 10 will shoot that and capture it as it is. That tenth photographer who's into fine art is looking to what he or she wishes to show, adding that extra element of uniqueness of creativity. So it's the own, the artist's own creative vision. So when people ask me how do I transit from documentary to fine art, I have a sort of some tips that will I think when you think about them you'll see the difference between documentary and uh, fine art. The first thing is that I always recommend is study the masters. Look at the, those fine art photographers from the past. And, and by the way, some of the fine art photography that I see, I don't get, I don't understand it uh, and, and why, why it's selling. But, uh, you know, and that's another thing, by the way, with fine art photography to an extent fine art is defined by those people who buy it, right? 
and and sometimes I can't believe the prices that are paid for s some of the art, um, the fine art that's done. And I must say also that most truly fine art photographers shoot in black and white. That's just the, the way it is, why it is, uh, you can figure out there's a lot of reasons for it. But anyway, uh, if you're interested in, in fine art photography, start creating a body of work. Focus, focus on a particular body of work and start to put it together. And it, f it frames your mind, it frames how you're looking at a scene, right? Experiment, try new approaches, try new things. If you don't have your, your unique style yet or, or your unique ideas and, and vision as a photographer, experiment. Go out and shoot a lot. If you aren't shooting at least once a week, then you're, you're not going to advance in uh, fine art photography. There's just no, no denying that, no doubting that. Um, <laughs> one thing that I, I say this sort of tongue in cheek, but think about it. If you want to advance in fine art photography, don't use presets. Stop using other people's presets. You can't become a fine art photographer if you're relying on someone else's presets. You have to develop your preset, your way of looking at the world, whether it be putting in a lot of black space in your images, if, if highlighting clouds, uh, 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 making collages and montages that put together two thoughts, maybe even juxtaposing thoughts. Um, uh, and uh, and this is something that I that took me many years to do, but but I, I think you will have to think about this if you want fine art photography. Turn away any work that doesn't fit into your vision, that isn't part of your focus. I often get asked about photographing weddings and bar mitzvahs. Thank God I have never had to do one in my life, nor will I ever. <laughs> right? I mean, I, those are very special people who can deal with the, the bridezillas and the mother-in-laws and, and uh, whatever. So, uh, and, and they're worth every penny they get paid, believe me. So, um, yeah, don't, you know, uh, stay in your vision. And I get, I get calls from editors or whatever um, saying, you know, would you do this photography? Some corporation wants to highlight something and I'll say no, but I can recommend other people. I have a list of people that I recommend to uh, because I know they're interested in that, that commercial um, side of things. So those, those are the things that, that come to me. I, I, I don't, I, I would say, uh, you know, with, with, um, with fine art photography versus documentary. The other thing, I, one thing I want to end with is this. Uh, critics, professional critics, uh, art critics, often are the ones that put the crown of fine art photographer on, on a person, on, on an artist. Um, you know, okay, that's great. I, I, do you realize that 90 some odd percent of those critics have never lifted a camera in their lives? They're critics. That's what they're designed to do. And that's another thing that I would I feel strongly about. If you're looking for critique of your work, work within a camera club where you have different interests and so on. Stop going on the internet. There are people whose whole lives are, are spent knocking other people's work down, finding little flaws here or little flaws there. That that isn't critique. That's criticism and that's pretty uh, pretty low, low brow stuff. Um, go for the more intense criticism where people can really help you and explain why something doesn't work for them. It doesn't mean it doesn't work for you, but more, more of that intimacy in, uh, in, in feedback is, is uh, certainly much more helpful. Thank you, Les. That was very insightful. Thank you. Joe, so, could I follow up with a question on that? Sure. Mm -hmm. Les, as yeah. you moved into the fine art photography and into the digital from film, did you find your capture of the photo 
a lot differently or was some of that move captured in processing that you didn't prior do? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I mean, um, documentary has a whole different spin on it and I can pretty well capture, and, or most photographers can capture what they need to, uh, to be acceptable or even excellent for magazine work or newspaper work um, it, fairly easily. In fine art photography, not so. You have to do a lot more work after you have snapped that shutter. It used to be, I remember Geographic and some of the other publications I photographed for, Forbes, Time, et cetera, they, uh, that I would say that 90 to 95% of my work was done once I pressed that shutter. Now it's 5% because you know I have to spend time downloading it, sorting it, doing this and that and, and so on. Now, I have to tell you, I have never used Photoshop in my life. I came on too late in the digital game to learn it. I use um, Capture One uh, uh, since I've migrated to to um, to um, uh, uh, medium format. I'm using Capture One, but I also am pretty adept at Lightroom. Uh, so those are my the two my two go to um, software processing units. But here's what I want to say: I, I I know so many times people get told, "Oh, well, you Photoshop that image," as if it, mostly this comes from amateurs or wannabes. Oh, you photoshopped that image. What does that mean? What, what are you talking about? Do you realize that Moon over Hernandez, which, uh, uh, which uh, Ansel Adams shot, do you know he spent two weeks, 10 to 12 hours a day in the dark room, changing exposure, changing the fixer, changing the developer to get it where he wanted to? He manipulating the image. What was that? Manipulating the image to what he wanted it to be. That's right. That's what art is. Right. That's what I, when when a, my wife, who's a who's a, a, a fine oil artist, she when she goes to paint, she's starting with a blank canvas. Everything is 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 made by her hand. So I would not feel at all. Don't feel at all intimidated or or people questioning your thing. If you're doing fine art. That's what you're doing. I can't do that as a journalist. As a journalist, I have to take the picture and it's got to be accurate. I can't clone anything out. I can't uh, I have to make sure beforehand that there aren't wires showing if I don't want it in there. But if they're in there, I got to leave them in there. Right. So two totally different approaches, both of them wonderful. And like I always say, I, I you know, I can't believe that, you know, I've been doing this for so many years. Uh, and people actually pay me for doing what I love. So, you know, work at it, work at it until you get um, proficient. And and that's another thing is the camera should become second nature to you. It should, it should be like your fingers. You should know it inside and out so that the technical part of photographing is not a barrier. And now you're focusing on the art, even if you're a journalist, even if you're doing the documentary part, you're doing landscapes, you're doing travel imagery, just knowing, uh, being comfortable with your camera is, is really the critical, the critical thing. That's my opinion. Uh, may I ask a, a technical question? Of course. Uh, and, and as you're probably aware, there's a, a tremendous emphasis by camera producers now on resolution. And you being a famous printer, I'm curious to know what you think about that and how many pixels do you think is enough? I, I personally don't print much bigger than 16 by 12. Uh, 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 what is your opinion on these uh, uh, megapixel wars? I, I think they've gotten really kind of insane. And the thing you have to think about with megapixels is as you increase megapixels, your chance for error increases because your the focus becomes critical and uh if you're off even the slightest bit from your intended focus it's a real problem uh now uh, joe's been to my studio and he's seen we have a five foot by nine foot canvas in my office part of my studio um of uh landscape uh, 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 
uh, in the Canadian Rockies, okay, Rampart Pond, and five feet by nine feet. That was shot with a 12 megapixel Nikon D800, D700, a 12 megapixel, five feet by nine feet, right? It, 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 that is far and well enough, but here's the thing. I shot it with a tilt shift lens. So it is perfectly focused front and back. So oftentimes it's not a question of pixels. It's a question of your technique and your equipment, right? So uh, I, I would not worry about it. A 16 by 20, uh, a, the typical 24 megapixel camera is absolutely fine. Uh, 50 megapixels is wonderful, but I, I, I don't see that it will make that much of a difference. Uh, and, and we print not just our own work, but we print for some very well famous photographers um, who, who use us on very special circumstances for prints. And that uh, there's, we don't see any reason for going uh, larger. Now, asterisk, okay? I'm shooting a 100 megapixel camera right right now, the Fuji GFX 100. And um, the reason for that is because as jo Joe has also seen, we produce murals that are 25, 30 feet wide by 10 feet long. Some of them are 17 feet tall uh, by, by long. Those are immense uh, murals and there you need 50, in my opinion, I would say you need the 50 to 100 to get that kind of resolution in, in a, uh, it depends upon the print, the paper rather, you're using also. With canvas, it's not as critical because the can canvas um, has, uh, it is, is, has already so much of a grain structure in it, if you will, grain, I say in, in, in quotes. But, um, but yeah, there are times when it makes sense to shoot larger, but only under for specific kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Mark, you had a question I think you were going to ask. Um, yeah, I do, Lester. Um, I was looking at your, I've actually got two questions that kind of are a little bit related to each other. Um, I was looking at your website and was, uh, your, your photographs are wonderful. But my, my first question is, is, how do you decide whether to render an image as black and white or color and then what is your approach to editing the image? Okay, uh, yeah, related questions. Okay, um, so here's the thing is I shoot mostly black and white now. I mean, it sounds silly because when I shot for geographic, everything is color. Uh, most of my career has been color. Um, but I've been weaned on the greats. You know, I, I've been, like I told you, my dad steeped me in, in some of the most wonderful um, master photographers of their day, and I follow a lot of people uh, today who shoot black and white. So um, here's, here's the thing that surprises a lot of people. When I go out, I turn my camera sensor to black and white. I'm going to say something, and you can get angry with me, or disagree <laughs> with me, but I'm going to say it anyway. You cannot <laughs> be a great black and white photographer if you don't look at the scene in black and white. Now, am I saying that you can't translate a color image to black and white? Well, in a sense, I'm saying that, but I'm not, but not fully. I mean, most people say, oh, I can't do anything with this color photo, so let me try it in black and white. Uh-uh. 99.9% .9 of the times, it's not going to really work. You'll get a picture, but you won't, you won't get a, a, um, a one of excellence. So I go out, I turn my, my dial to the sensor to black and white, and then I go out. That allows me to see shadows. It allows me to see the highlights. It allows me to see contrast. It allows me to see the density of the image. It allows me to see patterns. Uh, one time I was on a, a ferry here between uh, Maui and Molokai, it was sunrise, it was, I left before dark, it was uh, sunrise happened, and I looked across at Molokai with its beautiful cliffs and, and crenellations in the cliff structure, and I saw that, that that's, that's a gorgeous, the way the sun was coming up and highlighting just part of the, of the crenellations as a black and white. 
when I looked through my camera, since I'm shooting black and white, there it was in black and white. In color, it would have been a disaster. So I, the first thing I recommend is, uh, I, when I go out, I go out uh, basically to shoot black and white. Now, having said that, last week I was on uh, the island of Kauai and I love to shoot the rainbow eucalyptus trees there in, on Kauai, they're gorgeous. And when I did that, there's no point shooting that in black and white. They're called rainbow eucalyptus for a reason. <laughs> so I switched over to color and then spent the uh, glorious morning shooting it in color and reacquainting myself with my color work um, and uh, trying to do it in a fine art manner rather than in a landscape manner, right? Uh, so, so yeah, that's uh, uh, to answer your uh, question is that, you know, I, I think if you're going to shoot black and white, try shooting in black and white and not shooting in color and translating it. If you think you have an image that you shot in color and can work in black and white, by all means, go ahead, experiment, try it. Um, most people, when they do that, do not put enough contrast in the image. Black and white, so much depends upon contrast that between uh, your shadows and 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 your light, uh, you want to you want to um, to make the image stronger in black and white. If that's your intention, uh, I shot an image on uh, in, on the Nepali coast last week, and uh, it was uh, it was would not have worked in color. It was a sunset would not have worked in color. In black and white, it came out very nicely. So it you know it really it very much uh, depends. Uh, but once you do, then you can you can experiment with post processing and seeing uh, how how far you want to go with it. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, Les, I, this is Rich Scar. Um, I, if I can, I want to shift shift gears a little bit. I want to maybe get a little more personal. I want to know more about your father. You know, we're all. I think many of us want to still think that we can influence our kids, even though they're older, whatever, to, to, to look and think visual. And I think my kids are, but they've never fully taken up a camera, I think. But tell me, tell me more about your father. You say uh, he was an immigrant, whatever. But what caused him to, to take up photography? And then your uncles got into it. And then more personal anecdotes would, anecdotes would be fine. But tell me about um, what captured you about that? Did you feel like it was just going to be a job? Or do you, what really affected you personally? And then the final piece of that is, uh, is a little bit of different. Is uh, how did you turn out to be so crazy a guy to take on some of these assignments that you did? That took a lot of craziness or guts or courage, whatever. And I think that's a part of the problem with not being creative is that we hold ourselves back. Anyways, long question, but tell us a little more in anecdotes about your background. Okay, can you repeat the question? No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's funny. My father passed away in 1972, and um, I, I have to tell you, to this day, I miss him sometimes because he was the most, um, he was really a wonderful man and um, full of energy um, and um, funny and uh, very loving. So, you know, he would take me to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, and uh, that's how I got my love of Egypt initially. Uh, as Joe knows, I've written three, three historical novels about uh, ancient Egypt, and a, a fourth one will be coming out uh, uh, later this year or early next year. Um, so he instilled in me a love for art and, and a, an excitement for learning. My father was an inveterate learner. He, he, if he, of course, they didn't have internet those days, but if he wanted to know something, he'd go to the library and um, he, yeah, he was, he was just a, a, a good all around guy. And then he taught me, I'll, I'll give you one anecdote with him. One day he takes me to um, Manhattan and uh, I was about, I don't know, 12 years old at the time. And he's carrying his camera bag, but also a jug of water. What the heck is he carrying a jug of water for? So it gets to be toward evening, you know, twilight. And we stop in front of Central Park on 59th Street, and he he gets takes off his bag, he gets on the ground and pours the water onto a concavity in the sidewalk, a broken sidewalk part, right? And 
I'm mortified at the age of 12. You're embarrassed to hell. Here's my father lying on the floor, shooting reflections of the buildings. And he's saying to me, all right, take, take your finger. And when I tell you to tap it in the water, so he would get ripples in the water, right? I'm standing there just, I must have been so red in the face, um, mortified. But that was my dad. Um, uh, the, some of the joys um, were going to Har Harlem with him, uh, where we would typically be the only two white people uh, there. And uh, as he walked by vendors and, and um, store owners and people in the street, everyone would say, hey, Mr. Martin, hi, Mr. Martin he would photograph them with respect and in context and then what he would do is get prints made he wasn't a printer but he'd get prints made and then bring it to them so you know it, it was just a sweet thing to do um he would never give uh people who were begging in the streets he would never give them money but instead again as i got older much to my embarrassment he would take them to horn and hearted or someplace else and buy them a meal which I thought was a great thing to do. So that's, that was the influence my dad had on me. Um, and, uh, you know, I just wish you were alive to go out and shoot with him, basically, you know? That, great story. That's, yeah. yeah. Thank, thanks, Les. So good. So I, excuse me for jamming in the last part of the question, but I was, I, I had asked his second part of that is, is that do you, uh, you've done a lot of wild things and shooting assignments, whatever. And what, Talk to us a little bit. Did you did you feel like you were a courageous person, or were you as timid as the rest of us? But you just wanted to go and get it. I, I'm more timid as I get older. I will tell you that. <laughs> uh, I know it well. No, I'm, Joe asked me about this. I'm going to give you a quick rundown. Okay, I, I have been arrested in Egypt uh, two weeks after Anwar, Anwar Sadat was assassinated. I took a photo that in an area I wasn't supposed to. I felt the most horrendous jab in my ribs and a broke a rib. Uh, a guy, a guard jammed his AK-47 in my, in my uh, rib and I was arrested. Um, I had spent the, the previous day getting some great photographs on the Nile uh, of people weaving baskets, et cetera. The, the arresting officer took my, my film out and just exposed it and that was that. But anyway, um, I've been, uh, I, I would just want to mention a couple things. I'll show you some pictures if you'd like. Um, I've gotten almost deathly hypothermic in the P Pyrenees Mountains. I was hiking and a sudden storm came over. And if not for a very wonderful man who rescued me and gave me his uh, a coat until we got to shelter, uh, I might not be talking to you right now. But I did get the shots I needed. So that's the good thing. Um, I was in Africa. Let me see. Joe, can I have the screen? Yes, you can, uh, you, you can share screen. You just, okay, let me just um, the, the green the area where it's the square, share screen. Okay, you have that there? No, you have it, not me. There you go. Okay, perfect. Okay. See it. Yeah. All right, so let me uh, give you an example here. Is um, this, uh, this alligator, this um, crocodile in, in Africa, 16 feet long, uh, chased me. Uh, Fortunately, I had just eaten a, 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 um, a, a small deer uh, the day before, so it couldn't run fast, but it, but it was a wake-up call anyway. Um, the, here in, uh, in the Galapagos, I was photographing these um, sea lions, and uh, I saw this cute little puppy here, a pup, so I decided to photograph it, but all of a sudden, a woman screamed out, Les, behind you! And uh, I got bitten in the butt by its mother. So, <laughs> so never, never get between a mom and her and her offspring. <laughs> That's the lesson I got from that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what else. Are there any others here? Um, oh, this is a funny one. Uh, uh, I was staying at friends' houses in in um, the Yukon Territory. My wife was with me actually, and. I went out for an early morning walk from their, their cabin and I see this fox and I say, oh my God, it's gorgeous. I had my camera with me. I start following it for a half a mile in the woods and it just sat down at one point and looked at me. So I photographed it and I thought, hey, you know, aren't I special getting this shot of this fox? I come back to have breakfast and there's my wife feeding, <laughs> feeding the <laughs> 
box uh, an egg. It turns out it was a, it was you know had been um, uh, sort of adopted by the by the couple. So I wasn't Mr. Um, Safari guy after all. Um, yeah, so there've been the crazy things there. Um, I have. Um, let me see if I can just get to this quickly. Um, I was uh, also uh, in again. This happened in Yukon Territory, but up near the Arctic, uh, uh, past the uh, Arctic Circle, and and photographing this this grizzly for um, the whole morning, seven o'clock, and probably for two two and a half hours. Uh, it got close to us, stood up on its hind legs, which is unusual for um, for a grizzly, especially in the tundra. I was with a friend, a, a fellow photographer who weighs about 280 pounds. I weigh half of that probably, and he um, he's a lot slower than me. So that's the key note, key thing when you go <laughs> photographing bears is you want to go with someone who's slower. So when when it stood up on its hind legs, I wasn't that worried. Uh, but then it started to get closer and closer, and uh, eventually it um, grabbed my tripod and dragged it off into the tundra. And uh, you see a, a more close-up here of um, of it, uh, you know, with the, where it had eaten the tripod and gnawed at it. And um, that's me sort of showing it to you. Um, the um, but the th here's the thing with the, with those bears. Uh, the uh, this is an interesting fact about the Yukon. The Yukon is so underpopulated. Uh, California uh, um, Yukon is 20% larger than California, and um, uh, California has 35 million people. Yukon has 34,000. 23,000 live in Whitehorse, the capital city. That leaves 11,000 people for a land larger than California. It has 30,000 bear, 60,000 moose, 350,000 caribou. So your chances of seeing wildlife are much greater than seeing people. The problem with that is that 70%, 70% of the grizzly bears in the tundra are born, grow up, and die without ever seeing a human being, 70%. So that bear was simply curious. He just kept coming, and when I took this shot with my Nikon in those days, um, uh, 400 millimeter, 200 to 400, I had to keep on going down to 200. That's the last focus shot I got of it. So he was 16 feet away from me. And then when I left um, quickly, as he got closer, he just reached up, knocked over my tripod, and, and dra dragged it in his teeth uh, out into the tundra. And start to chew it. Uh, it's one of the only, uh, only three times I've ever had to um, spray a bear with bear spray, and that was one of it, one of them. Uh, but in any event, that's uh, that's a, a, a story. So you ask about crazy things that have happened. So I've been attacked by a grizzly, and uh, I guess the one thing I will tell you about crazy, okay, just as a fun thing. Joe, do I have time? You have time. Yes. Okay. Um, I was commissioned by National uh, Wildlife Federation to do a story back in the 80s on um, the praying mantis, the life cycle of the praying mantis. So I set up a terrarium in the house. I took some shots in the field, but I, I need to show um, its breeding and its the, the um, egg case hatching and so on. So I set up a terrarium in my house and I paid kids to go out and get the egg cases, which are technically called uuthika. And I, and they, I pay them a quarter a piece. Well, what happened was suddenly the kids come back one day, and there were like six of these kids, each with a shopping bag full of them. It, it cost me in excess of twenty bucks to, for these egg cases. So I put them in the refrigerator to mimic, um, uh, to mimic uh, cold weather. Uh, and uh, but first I, I had to capture the mating the actual mating so here's a here's a picture of um here's a picture of the male introducing the sperm packet into the much larger female right and then his reward for doing that is the female here biting its head off and you can see her she's got a part of his head 
in her mouth right there, right? So that was his uh, thing. But anyway, so after the winter, um, I took out these, uh, after several weeks in the refrigerator, I took out the egg sacs and what, what's neat is they hatch at night in, in nature also. And this is the Uthika, this is the egg case. This is what uh, it looks like, right? And it's full of air in air, air pockets, which insulate it through the winter. And then at night, this is what happens. Between 100 and 300 little tiny um, praying mantises hatch on these wonderful little gossamer strings that come out. And it was a ball photographing them um, exiting, etc. And then and every, as soon as I put the egg cases in there, I, I put a mesh top on top to make sure they didn't get out, right? And the next day I would let them out. I'd take down the terrarium and let them out in nature. Well, one night I did it. You have to photograph it between like midnight and four o'clock in the morning. So I, I was up till four o'clock in the morning. I was tired as hell and I forgot to put the mesh covering on. So I had three of these in the terrarium, three of them. And when I woke up in the morning, I had almost a thousand of these praying mantises all over my apartment. I was single at the time. So <laughs> it's all over my apartment, the curtains, the bed, everything, every place, every place. And for the next few months, I found them, fewer of them, but they got larger and larger because they are carnivorous and cannibalistic. So they will kill each other and eat each other and so on. <clears throat> they got bigger and bigger and bigger until they were full size. Now, the funny part of it is at the time I was dating another faculty member and I happened to have her over and <laughs> um, she just jumped up at one point screaming because there was a, a big praying mantis in her hair. And uh, so that was the end of that love affair. And <laughs> she swore she would never come to my apartment again. <laughs> so there are perils to the work that I do, right? Okay. Let, so, let's, um, Liz back. had a quote. Oh, go ahead. All right, I'm back. Go ahead. Next question. Liz had a, a question for you. Liz, are you there? Rick, I just wanted to emphasize how crazy it really gets, you know. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I think I have a bit of a different question. So as a photographer, I struggle a lot with my self-confidence. I'm told a lot that I'm good at what I do and that I have an eye, but I always stay humble. So as a professional, somebody at, at your level, uh, what are what is some advice so that I could kind of get over that insecurity? That's great, yeah. Um, first of all, we all have that. I have to tell you is, that, you know, it's, it's always the, the um, fear of a consultant and a professional photographer for people to find out how little we really know, right? Um, and that, that's sort of an old adage. But the, the truth of the matter is the, the way I would suggest is, number one, get a lot of practice. Just get really good at what you do. Uh, share it with people that you really respect. And that's why I like camera clubs with people like Joe in it that, that really uh, can take you under their wing and just say, yeah, th this is really great. Here's, uh, do you like it? What about the image do you like? Um, and then say, well, here's, you might, you might consider uh, improving it this way or else I'll hold up my, my hand and, and crop the image right in front of the person and say, you know, would, would this be uh, would you consider a, a crop like this in it? Oh, just try it and see if you like it better. So that you begin to own your skills more. And then finally, your, your, um, you, your confidence will build. Uh, submit to some of your camera club um, contests, right? And you, you, won't, you won't always win, of course, but you'll get some interesting you'll not only get interesting feedback, but you'll see what other people are doing too. Not that you want to emulate it, but you get from, uh, you don't want to emulate other people, but, you, but you'll but you get from them little tidbits that you hadn't thought of before, right? Do you want something out in that to give people confidence? Because you're, you're such a good coach. No, I, I think you nailed it there. I think you nailed it, Les. No, you nailed it. 
Anybody else have a question for uh, can, This is Judy. Can I ask a question along those lines? Um, how do you, and, and I'm fairly new to this, how do you accept others people's criticisms, I guess it would be? Um, maybe you can take them as not being criticism, um, but how do you accept the views of others? That's great. First of all, I, I don't like criticism. I like critique. I like, and there's a difference between the two. Uh, if the goal is to criticize, that's kind of pejorative and it, it indicates an intent. I like someone who will critique my work, who feels um, involved enough and intimate enough with my work to really give me some feedback. I have those people, fortunately, in, in my life. Um, there are times when I'm working on an image for, for an hour trying to uh, post-process it in, in, um, in Capture One or whatever, my wife will come in to tell me something and she'll say, oh my God, that's awful, right? <laughs> or or I, uh, so I have that built-in critique uh, and I respect her opinion because she's got a good sense of composition. Uh, but Bob, my assistant, who does no no photography like mine. He does studio photography, uh, semi-nude photo photography, fashion photography. I do none of that. And, uh, but he has a great eye and we, we, he will give me really good feedback on some things, uh, which I really appreciate. And what I've learned is that I will always listen. Whether a person's criticizing or critiquing, I will always, always listen. There might be a little gold nugget hidden in that. There may be, uh, and I will ask questions. Well, why do you feel that way? What, how does that image make you feel? Would it be different uh, with your suggestions in it? So I like to be open because I don't have the answers to everything. And, and I think due to those other suggestions, my work has often been, been improved. Uh, so I, I don't deny that. And, and uh, sometimes my editors, will come to me and say, let's, remember I told you about National Geographic, I'm the first one to see the images. Then I, my editor comes down and the images are spread on a light table because they were all slides in those days, uh, spread on a light table and we discuss the story and uh, he or she will tell me, yeah, this I like, this this is, is not, do, doesn't tell the story less. It, I have to, don't forget the editor has to match the writing with the imagery. And some images can be great but it doesn't further the story. It doesn't further the reader's understanding of the issue. And that, that's what I loved about Geographic is their commitment to uh, education, to really helping, helping people understand the environment or whatever the story was. Uh, yeah. So that, that, uh, that's how I would respond to that. Yes, Les. Uh... I want to thank you up front here for taking time and uh, doing this for our club. It's very special for you to do this. And, and anyway, I have a question to ask. You had you had elaborated a couple of times on some of your clients and what you've done uh, work for. And as I was reading your bio, I saw you did something on a nuclear submarine. That fascinates me. I can't believe you went on a submarine. And that has to be a, a high point in a, a, doing a submarine. And uh, Pardon? And one other thing, I, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, it was the USS Tautog, uh, uh, which is um, an attack submarine out of um, Oahu. And uh, I was privileged to be on that uh, for a while. And it was absolutely a life changing experience in terms of how much I respect um, those men and women who serve, who do that service. It is very, very difficult. And they have skills that you would not believe not believe yeah we uh we killed a soviet sub for almost two days and it didn't even know we were we were stalking it so there you go there's really a lot of skill involved that's amazing i have one other question for you um fine art does your fine art have to tell a story also you're as you say when you do a, a fine art photograph you're saying does it also have to tell a story well you know this is a question I get asked a lot. Does every image have to tell a story? And in a way, in a way it does by definition. If I take a shot out 
the window here, at, out the door here, at, at, at the water and the palm trees, I'm telling a story. I'm saying, this is what Hawaii, this area of Hawaii is like. So in a way, something like that's uh, telling a story. Um, there's, uh, so, but in fine art, it's a whole different thing. I'm not concerned in the viewer picking up a storyline. With fine art, the only thing that matters is the artist's feelings and emotions in it. And if you like it, fine. If you don't like it, not. If you want to buy it, fine. If not, that's why 90 or some odd percent of fine artists don't make a living, right? They're not selling. They're, if, they're, if you decide to go into fine art, you can. I mean, there are several successful ones, uh, fine artists. But the primary goal of a fine artist is not to make money, but rather to, to express themselves, express their vision, their unique technique, their unique, um, uh, their, 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 their unique vision. <clears throat> That's what's important. And hopefully people will appreciate it. Right? <clears throat> then you have people like Maplethorpe, who, who might do things that are horribly offensive to people. But that's what he, he sees as his art. That's all that matters, right? Yeah. I have a question. Um, yeah. Les, you mentioned, um, this is Jan Williams. You mentioned Capture yeah. One a minute ago. And I am wondering, I, I shoot with a Fuji X-T4. And I'm wondering if you would comment on um, Capture One versus Lightroom or Photoshop. I can't comment about Photoshop because I don't use it. Uh, Bob uses it periodically, but only when we have a large mural to do because um, for, for technical reasons, he, he has to use Photoshop for that. But uh, almost, I mean, I, yeah, um, I can't think of the last time we used Photoshop in our studio, uh, but if we did, it would be Bob who would have used it. But I can tell you, um, Lightroom and Photoshop are similar uh, in, in, in what they can do. One leaps ahead of the other. Uh, I, think, I think Lightroom is a more thought out and proven uh, post-processing software. It's been around longer. It has a huge, um, a huge investment in people and knowledge so that they're constantly improving the product. I'm, I'm happy to see that happening uh, time and time again. For example, um, for example, um, Capture One, only a few months ago, I think it was September, October, September, uh, for the first time introduced um, focus stacking and, um, uh, and HDR uh, pro post processing where Lightroom has had that for years. Um, but by the way, I have not uh, used either in Capture One yet. The reason being that I was traveling and I didn't want to put it on my laptop and, and, and find that it didn't work for me until I got back home. So I'll, I, I will install it later, but I hear it's not as good as, um, as Lightroom's abilities. I don't know, I haven't tried it, so I can't say, but I do love Capture One, I have to tell you. Uh, for a thoughtful, mindful photographer, if you're shooting uh, fine art, if you're shooting uh, slower than you know, the 25 or 40 frames a minute, um, then I think Capture One forces you in a way to slow down. Uh, it has huge ability in color management, um, in color grading. I think, it's, I think it's better than I feel anyway, and Bob feels, um, and Bob is very technical with this stuff. Um, we both feel that it, it offers a better, a more artistic solution to your work. Uh, but it's another learning curve, like anything else. So if you're happy with Lightroom, stick with it. I think it, there's nothing wrong with it. We I don't have, have be... either. Oh, OK. Um, I would, if for the interest of going further with that, Jen, I would say uh, start with Lightroom, because there are more people who know it and can help you with it than there are people who know Capture One. That's just, a, I think, a practical issue, not a, not a um, technical issue that you may want to consider. Thank you. I mean, Joe is, is expert in it. I know that. I'm sure other people in the camp in the club are. 
Yeah. But Fuji, you know, uh, uh, Capture One is especially good for Fuji. The Fu Fuji color profiles in Capture One are far better than in, okay. than in Lightroom. Once that's, you import that's it, why I asked. Yeah, and once you import it, I have to say it's beautiful. I used to shoot, like I said, medium format, but um, uh, yeah. Hi, Les. Uh, this is and Dave Marquetto. We, um, we met in yeah. uh, Maryland last, um, last summer during your um, seminar on, uh, on Fuji. Oh, OK. All right. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I was really impressed. Uh, Les, can you tell us a little bit uh, about your tours, about your workshops? Can you kind of give us an idea of what expectations we might have and sort of the benefits of uh, maybe going a little further in our craft? Okay, um, let me start with workshops. Uh, we give our workshops in our studio in Have a Degrees, Maryland. Um, we limit them to no more than six people ever. Uh, some workshops, like our portfolio development workshop, uh, which is a weekend workshop, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, um, is uh, limited to four people. Uh, and um, there is work that starts about six weeks ahead of the workshop. There, there are some activities that we, that we have for those participants to do prior to coming to the workshop. Uh, and that, so four people there. Our print workshops are, uh, are, are now, they used to be six, but nowadays we do not allow more than four in those also, because we want everyone to have the, uh, an individual experience. We have four large format printers in our studio, uh, two 17 inch, one 24 inch, and one 44 inch printer. We are sponsored by Moab uh, Fine Art Papers and by x and by Canon. So, uh, we're, and obviously we have Canon printers. So we are, uh, so as a result of that, unlike other workshops, when you come to our print, find our print workshops, you can print as many prints as you want, as large as you want, basically. Um, uh, I shouldn't say that, not necessarily as large as you want, it depends. But, but basically um, you get lots of prints, people take home eight, six, eight, 10 prints, which more than pays for the workshop considering today's lab prices. And these are color, these are on very fine art papers uh, made, by, made by Moab. Um, and also you can print canvas if you want, that, that's fine, too. that's also good. So those our workshops are in, in our studio or like when I teach um, pano, how to do pano photography, uh, then we go outside of the studio, but then we come back in for post-processing uh, of those images. Um, then I lead tours around the world. So right, right. We, yeah, and those are small group <laughs> tours, never more than eight, never more than eight. Some like the, we were supposed to go to Patagonia. Joe, uh, Joe was going to be uh, one of us. There were uh, there were seven in that. Um, the the trip to um, the, the trip to Africa was also was uh, six people in that because I, I hire an extra Jeep in Africa to, so that we're not crowded at all. Um, everybody gets their entire road to themselves. Those of you who've been to Africa before, you know it can get crowded. I don't want people banging heads, going from the left side to the right side to see a lion. So everyone has their own row. Um, uh, so, you know, we go to um, Ecuador, uh, the Galap and the Galapagos, uh, Peru, um, uh, to Sri Lanka. Joe, you were in Sri Lanka with us, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. Sri Lanka, um, uh, Myanmar. Uh, uh, I used to do Egypt. I'm not doing Egypt right now. Uh, I've been to Egypt more than a dozen times, but not now. Um, and then um, Antarctica, um, we do that. Uh, every third year, um, the Arctic uh, <clears throat> and um, Yukon territory I do every year. Uh, every every um, during the during the change of of color season in the in the um, tundra, so you get the reds and the yellows. It's gorgeous there in the tundra. Uh, so we go as far we go about seventy miles past the Arctic Circle, 
but we also go into to um, Alaska three times uh, to photograph other things. Um, Yukon's just an amazing, uh, an amazing territory like no other. It's photographically very rich. I do uh, workshops in uh, the Canadian Rockies and um, other places I'm sure I'm forgetting. I, I'm sorry, but uh, yeah. So, and those are, are very carefully planned. I have a philosophy that um, I, I don't want to be photographing while my clients are photographing. I want to be available for them. And that's why I typically go prior to the, um, to the workshop so that I understand the area. There are exceptions to it. And then there are uh, it, t times like the Patagonia trip where I have clients who I know will need no help basically. And that would be Joe, uh, you know, Chris, Chris Kluwit, um, uh, uh, and um, uh, Edmund and, and Norm and so on, a, a group that I know will not really need help. So we travel more as friends in that case. But, you know, I was really fortunate to be able to be at the um, couple of hour workshop uh, with with uh, with you and uh, Bob for Fuji. I, I can share mm -hmm. just a quick anecdote. I was um, at one of the stations uh, with with Bob that you provided. I think it was um, the portrait station and I couldn't get the uh, the angle I wanted. And I was fussing and not familiar with the Fuji you know, new, new equipment and so on. And, and Bob very gently came up to me and he said, you know, a lot of people don't realize that you can move the lights. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, so, you know, I really, I had some really practical takeaways there. I really enjoyed, uh, you know, meeting you less and uh, spending time with others. I think uh, in so many ways you learn, uh, you learn a lot from uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, David, can I interject yeah. one thing? Because I've taken a number of, uh, Les's tours. I would say that the names he just mentioned about some of the folks, uh, I'm friends with all of them. We regularly communicate with the email. We go to uh, the Northwest. Uh, I'll meet with Chris as an example. Uh, Norm, I know him and I know his situation with his family and stuff. And those kind of relationships you only can develop when you're with a small group of people. If you're with a group of 12 or 14, it just doesn't happen. And, uh, yeah. and that's one of the major benefits of what we do. Yeah. Thank you, thanks, that, that's true, so true. Other questions? Les, I have a question, <clears throat> but I really need to start it with an observation. Um, I saw you present at one of the uh, Light and Creativity workshops several years ago um, in the Harrisburg area. And what I was most impressed with was the fact that one person can have so much expertise and talent in both photography and printing that just kind of boggles my mind. Um, in my limited both photography experience- photography and what? And printing. Oh, okay. All right. In my limited experience just printing my own prints, um, I know enough to be dangerous, quite frankly, but um, I do know that it is an art in and of itself, but that it also requires a very different skill set from photography, even though they are related and somewhat codependent, I might say. But my question to you is, how did, did, did your, love of printing or your desire to get into the printing field evolve from your love of photography or did they you just have a, a natural inclination for both oh that, that's interesting I, I hadn't thought of that in that way um i guess i never i never imagined photography ending at 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 taking uh, the picture and having it on your computer nowadays, or just having it on a slide, um, I've always I've always thought of it as hanging in a museum, or having an, have it appear in a magazine, or having a client, you know, whether it be a private homeowner or or an office displaying it. That's always been my my. Um, way of looking at it. So I've never separated the two really. 
my grandfather was a photographer, by the way, my father's father. Uh, he, when he came from Europe, that's how he supported the family. And I remember as a child, it must have been from the time I was five, six years old, he would take me into the dark room. And I would remember, you know, shutting the lights and having the red light on and seeing an image come out of the, out of the uh, bath. And I, I, it was like magic. So to me, that's always been, I, I, I never thought of it as, it is two different skill sets, I agree, but I've always thought of it as something you had to learn as part of your um, development as a photographer. You know, Ansel Adams said, I'm paraphrasing him that, um, the uh, let's see uh, the um, photograph is the um, is the this photograph is the score the print is the performance right that's that's the way I look at it is that that is what you show people and and by the way I I I, I must say if you if when you look at someone's photos on their on their iPhone right isn't this what happens two point three seconds. That's the average time a person looks at a photograph on the iPhone. It's been measured about 2.3 seconds if you show a person a lot. Oh, that's nice. Yep. Yep. yep, yep. How long does it take a person to see something on the gallery, to watch it, to look at an exhibit on the gallery, right? This is amazing. Um, Joe, Joe knows I've referred to this before. In, in the, in the um, 80s, there was an experiment at a university about uh, um, to try to understand why, what people look at in color in black and white. So they, they, they um, establish a gallery on campus and they put an equal number of color images and an e with a number, equal number of black and white images. And this was done by the psychology department, not by the photography department. And they had cameras checking the eye uh, and how much time each person spent in front of an image. What they found, interestingly enough, was not what they had thought they would find. They expected the color images are brighter and stuff. This is what we, we, we it's been estimated there's, uh, we, we as humans see over 100,000 images a day in color, 100,000. And that means if I'm looking here, if I look here, that's a separate one, right? So we see over 100,000 distinct images. On, in TV, by the way, time it time it when you're watching a, a movie on TV. Usually the longest they'll keep one scene in is four to six seconds. Try it, try it, time it before they shift the view of it. So we see a lot of color. So they expected that's what would happen. But when they tabulated the data, people spend three times as much time, three times as much time in front of black and white images than color. Why? So they came up with this following thing. We see in color, when we're confronted with a black and white image, the first thing we have to do is decode it. In psychology, it's called decoding. You have to decode it and say, oh, I'm, I'm seeing this in black and white. It's the palm trees I'm looking at in black and white. They're usually in green, but they're in black and white for some reason. So we decode it. It's unconscious. It's unconscious, but it's there. It takes a, a little bit to do it. Um, then we enter a, a second phase, which is known as involvement. Uh, by doing that, you, your brain gets involved in the process of this decoding unconsciously, and you spend more time now looking at the shadows and the, the texture and the patterns in it and so on and so forth. Once you finish that phase, you come into the third and final phase, which is called ownership. They don't mean ownership, you buy it, that would be nice, but if it's my print, but um, <laughs> in ownership, they mean psychological ownership. Once you've gone through those first two processes, you, you, you feel a sense of ownership of it. And that takes, that requires you in a sense, psychologically to spend more time with it. Three times as much time as, as color. So just something to think about uh, in, in terms of your, um, uh, in, in terms of seeing, uh, uh, does your photography end in your computer and you send that you put things on, on Facebook or on Instagram, that's great, no problem, no problem at all. That's good, good way to go. Uh, but 
but it's only until you print, whether it be any of the printing modalities that we have today, not just fine art papers, which I'm partial to, but canvases and, and aluminum and wood and you know, the list goes on nowadays. Um, medium density fiberboard, uh, which is a nice medium for kids' rooms. Uh, so, yeah, that's the way uh, I, I particularly look at it. But not Thank the you, Liz. I, um, I also go back to the film days. Mm -hmm. I started with a film camera. And for that reason, I'm, I'm very passionate about um, the printed image itself, yeah. and which is why I bought my own printer and decided to Yay. learn that. I had have just found it a very frustrating learning curve. Um, it doesn't come as naturally yes. to me as, as photography does. So it's just interested in how you got into it. Thank you. Yeah, and by the way, the as frustrating as it is, you should have seen it 10 years ago. It was almost impossible. I, I found it extremely frustrating. Uh, Bob, Bob, was always helping me through it, but um, but yeah, it's going to get better and better as time goes on, and the colors it can reproduce are extraordinary. Uh, yeah, we have about uh, ten more minutes left. Uh, any other questions we might want to ask, Les? Yeah, yeah, Les, I want to get your opinion on something. <clears throat> Growing up in the seventies and eighties. A photographer, in my opinion, was viewed as like an elite task or hobby. Right? There wasn't a whole lot of them. And you found someone who's good at it, you're pretty impressed. But these days, every Tom, Dick, and Harry's got a cell phone, right? And they, everyone thinks they're a photographer with the cell phone. It, and then you got social media where you can share it, blah, blah, blah. Do you feel this explosion of technology and, and cameras and cell phones is diluting our art. I do, yes. Uh, let me give you a personal example of it. Uh, I used to do a lot of photography for Time Life publications. And um, they, I, I had stock images that editors knew about there. And they, they'd call me, do you have this image, that image? And if it was a, um, a quarter page in the magazine, I would, I, and th this is, mind you, in the 80s, 80s into the early 90s. It was a quarter page, um, or into the 2000s, actually. Uh, I would get $500. $500 from 1980, that's a lot of money. If it was a half page image, I would get $1,500. So I'm picking up Time Magazine, this was in 2000 something, and I notice a little, there's a little photograph, uh, eight page photograph in there. And underneath it, it said, I stock, I stock, never seen it before. So I called my editor, Tim Smith uh, over at, at uh, Fortune magazine. I said, Tim, what's this with I stock? He said, Les, pack up and go home. He said, you know how much we paid for that? I said, no. He said, 50 cents, 50 cents. I said, are you joking me? He said, no. He said, stock is gone. And indeed it is. I talked with Tony Sweet about it recently. He still gets a few bucks a month from stock. I just, I was at a conference at, at um, where I was exhibiting some of my images and uh, the woman from Adobe, Adobe uh, stock comes over to me and said, Les, we'd really like to have some of your images in, in our stock. I said, okay. I knew nothing about it. I said, uh, Adobe stock. I said, okay, I'll give you some images. Gave him 20 images. A month later, I get a check. I mean, I get a, a transfer to my bank account. Uh, I sold about a dozen images. Three of them were of the same elephant. 75 cents for all three. 75 cents. I called her. I said, take all my images off. I don't want to be associated with this, right? I just find it demeaning in a sense. But having said all that, everybody's a photographer nowadays. Everyone has an iPhone. Some people take marvelous uh, photos with them. They're really advancing the art. Uh, in, and Tony Sweet's a perfect example. Tony does some great work in, with uh, their, his uh, mobile phone. Um, other people, uh, 
but but in general, it is diluting the uh, the work. And you know, how many of them are in black and white? Not many. A lot of you know, they want the splashy, high contrast, uh, high, you know, images. Um, that they're eye candy. Everybody wants the eye candy quickly and see. Oh, that's nice. Move on to the next one. So it, I think there is a dilution effect. But I think there'll always be room for good, high quality um, photography. I think it's it's evolving just like it always has evolved uh, from the old days to now. Um, here's a, <laughs> I'll, let me, do I still have the screen? You do. Okay. Um, so let me, let me show you this. This here is, uh, th this, <laughs> this here is me um, shooting in the old days, right? I, I can't see that. We don't see that, no. Okay, so I'm, I'm not sharing. Let me go back. Okay. To, I think I turned off sharing the screen. Hold on a sec. Um, go back here, share screen. Okay, let's go back here. Go. So this is, shot, this is a shot of, um, you can see it now? Yep. Okay, uh, of Yukon Territory, and, and there's me photographing it. <laughs> Photography has advanced, folks. I no longer have to look that contraption <laughs> around and uh, with all the plates and everything else that's involved. So, Did you yeah, use gunpowder for a flasher? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, okay. What else? Ooh. Did I just lose you? Uh, no, we're here. Huh. Less? Yeah, we're, we're here. For some reason it's... Um, not appearing. Where's it? Where's it gone? Oh, there we are. Okay, good. So, I'll um, let's see. Stop share. Okay. Yeah. Any uh, any last questions for uh, Les before we uh, sign off? I have a quick question for you, Les. <laughs> uh, Terry here. Um, Hi, Terry. Would you consider macro type of photography as could it be considered as fine art? Who, who's photography? Macro, macro work. In other words, real fine close-up. Would you consider that in fine art? I, I'm not understanding the question. I'm sorry, Terry. And uh, the Mac Pro. No, uh, Les. He's saying if you, someone does macro photography with a close-up lens, oh, could oh, that oh, be oh, oh. considered fine art? Yes, yes, I'm sorry. I thought you said um, Mac, the Mac photography done on a Mac Pro. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yes, macro photography can be, can certainly be um, fine art photography. Absolutely. I see some excellent examples of it. Um, also, I'm seeing a lot of light painting uh, nowadays done in the studio that is technically very difficult, but beautifully done. And it's actually, you know, the, it almost imitates, imitates the old Dutch masters, right? Oh, that's another thing. Can I make a recommendation, to, uh, Joe? Yes, please. Yeah. Please go go to go to art museums, go go to the National Gallery, or to the Metropolitan Museum of Art or wherever, and look at the Dutch masters how they handle light. You will have a lesson. You're, you're not going to need to take any photo workshops. Just look. Just spend time in front of their images and look at how they, how they um, captured light so exquisitely. And it, it's a real learning experience for all of us, you know. On that on that same note, right there, there's a yeah. Facebook group called Still Life by Flashlight, and it's a photography ah. group that emulates the Dutch masters' lighting. In still really? okay. it's fabulous. So fabulous. Patricia, when you send me when you send me your stuff, your link, please send me that link too. I I will. Thanks. Thank <laughs> yeah. So if you and I want to continue this conversation in the following way. If you have any questions or you just want to dialogue, I'm pretty responsive unless I'm traveling or or out. Um, send me an email. It's lesspicker at gmail.com. L-E-S-P-I-C-K-E-R at gmail.com. And, and uh, I'm always interested in other people's uh, takes on things or uh, the questions you have sometimes help me to think about um, 
what materials I'm going to produce. Joe, you didn't mention also the, the photographic books that are on my website. If you go to my website and you go to ebooks, I have um, yes. like a, a 273 page book on travel photography. I have one on composition uh, uh, and other things that are very reasonably priced. And uh, but I, it'll give you a good background. Oh, and printing. If you want a book, uh, a comprehensive book on everything you need to know about digital printing, it's free, absolutely free. Go to my website. It's sponsored by Moab X Right and uh, Moab and X Right. And uh, if you go there, um, they uh, you'll be able to download it. And it's an ebook that uh, people find have told us they find rather helpful. Okay. Totally free. Well, Les, we want to thank you so much. This has been so entertaining as well as informative and instructive. Your, your stories about time life and National Geographic are just fascinating to hear. We really appreciated that. And thank you so much. And uh, well, if you we're going to be- Thank you for organizing Thank you for organizing uh, You're welcome. If you would, everybody would uh, unmute themselves for a minute, if you can do that. I would like you to do that because I think we want to give, I know we want to give Les a very loud round of applause for oh, him taking oh, his time and coming. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank, you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. you. Les, what I thank really you. wanted, Joe, was a beer. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, we'll catch you up. You, you can hold me to that one, Les. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's not going to be the cheap beer that you drink. <laughs> thank you so much and you have a great day uh les and to, and everybody on the call tomorrow you'll get an email we'll have this recording i'll have uh, les's email address in there for you so if you have any further questions um he's sitting there in the sun out in maui he'd be more than happy to answer your questions i am sure <laughs> okay thanks so much thank you, thank you. Thank you. Good night. thanks again thank les. Thank thanks you. les thanks you're welcome Plus, this is Dave Marchetto again, and I really enjoyed meeting you there in Maryland. Super, uh, super few hours there. That was a very interesting evening. I, uh, we never did that before, where we just have a conversation with a professional photographer and his stories about National Geographic and taking those images and putting them on the light table. And that's the first that he ever saw them, you know, and he can't do anything with them, you know, in terms of processing. Oh, my. That, that was, was such. Show. That was really one of the best, you know. Yeah, that was super, great. super. Okay, guys. See you. Um, see you later. Bye now. Good night, everybody. Okay. Frank, are you still there? Yeah, I am. Okay. <laughs> that, that was, was pretty good. Yeah, that was interesting, wasn't it? You know? Yeah. How did you get that red face today? You know, I don't know how that happened because I'm to I think I'm in my office and I have the door closed. And this room gets warm. And I think that's I know that's what it is. It's just hot in here. And uh, I never close the doors. It's usually cooler. But if Elaine gets a phone call or something, I didn't want that to uh, spill into the room. So it looked like you were out in the sun all day or something. Well, I was out for the sun this morning, uh, taking my walk. And it was uh, it was for quite a while. And of course, I had probably I, I don't have any wind burn because it wasn't windy. So I don't know. So do you have all your sidewalks cleaned off? Yeah, I'm all cleaned up around here. Uh, and hopefully it'll warm up a little bit. Uh, yeah. It's been, I mean, we were, I think we hit 20 today. Uh, so 